So let's go back and let's lo look at another problem. We completed 10-1. Let's take a look at 10 In providing accounting services to small businesses, you encounter the following situation pertaining to cash sales. Number one, Ferkel Company enters sales and sales taxes separately on its cash register. On April 10th, the register totals are sales of $22,000 and sales taxes of $1,100. We need to prepare the entries to record the sales transaction and related taxes for the Ferkel company on this one, okay? So what's the first thing we're going to do here, guys? The sales are recorded separately from the sales taxes. So how are we going to handle this? Anyone? What were the sales? And the sales tax? So what we might do here is show how much cash did we bring in? That's just the sales revenue. How much cash did we bring in, guys? 23100 exactly. 23100 And our credit will be sales revenue of 22000 and sales taxes payable of eleven hundred, right? That's the easy way to do it. Next. Crystal Company does not segregate sales and sales taxes. Its register total for April 15th is 13780 which includes a 6% sales tax. This is a little trickier, okay? So what is our cash going to be? 13780 How are we going to determine our sales revenue? Say it, no. Sales revenue, we're going to take the 13780 and divide it by 1.06, right? The sales, okay, think of this. The sales revenue, we collected 100% of the sales plus we collected 6% of the sales revenue, okay? 6% extra? Correct, because it was sales. So we collected in total 106%. But we need to figure out how much were the sales and what amounts the sales tax. So if we take 13780 and divide it by 1.06, what do we come up with? See, the whole amount is 106%, okay? So we want to figure out just the sales portion is what? $13,000. 13000 which means that sales taxes payable are the difference between 13780 minus 13000 or 780 Does anyone have questions on this? Do you guys understand how you're going to figure that out? Okay? Yes? No? How are you guys doing? Frustrated? Good? Okay.
these problems I'm going over, you're going to see these again, okay? It might be in a multiple choice, but that way, um, know how to calculate them based on either way. Let's look at the next one, 10-5. During the month of March, Olinger Company employees earned wages of $64,000. Withholdings related to these wages were $4,896 for Social Security, $7,500 for federal income tax, $3,100 for state income tax, and $400 for union dues. The company incurred no cost related to these earnings for federal unemployment tax, but incurred $700 for state unemployment tax. So the first thing we need to do is handle the employees portion. Let's not worry about the payroll tax expense from the employer. Let's just talk about the employee. So let's take and record the journal entry to record the salaries and wage expense and the salaries and wages payable. Assume that wages earned in March are gonna be paid in April. So we know it's not gonna be cash, it's gonna be a payable, okay? So what were the wages at? 64,000. So let's start by assuming that on March 31st, we've got salaries and wages expense of Sixty-four thousand. Then, how much were the FICA taxes that came out of those wages? Forty-eight ninety-six. What's the next one that came out? What's next? What's next? So isn't it the difference that we're going to have to pay everybody? The state unemployment doesn't come out of the payroll, the employees pay. Okay? The state unemployment comes out of the employer. Okay? Have you guys ever noticed on any check state unemployment? No, you just have FICA, federal, state, and any other expenses you care. So what are our payroll salary and wages payable? Anybody? 48,104. 48,104 will be the salaries and wages payable. Okay? Does everyone understand this? Any questions? Quit yawning. How do you do that again? Show me that one more time. Okay. What, look at that. Tell me how you think we got it. Remember that double entry system that we have? Mm -hmm. They got a balance, guys, yeah. which is awesome. They got a balance. Okay, now the next um, question says, prepare the entry to record the company's payroll tax expense. Now we're gonna deal with some other things. What, remember I told you that we have to match the FICA, right? And how much is the FICA we got to match? Forty-eight ninety-six. And what is the state unemployment? Sixty-four 
state unemployment, 700. So what is the payroll tax expense there? 5596? You guys see how I'm just adding them? Yep. How's that going, guys? Good. Does this make sense? Let's take 10-7. I'm hoping that if any of these confuse you, you're going to let me know. 10-7. Valenti Company publishes a monthly sports magazine fishing preview. Subscriptions to the magazine cost $28 per year. During November 2014, Valenti sells 6,300 subscriptions for cash, beginning with the December issue. Valenti prepares financial statements quarterly and recognizes subscription revenue for the end of the quarter. The company uses the account's unearned subscription revenues and subscription revenues. The company has a December 31st year-end period. We are going to prepare the entry in November for the receipt of the subscriptions. So we sold 6,300 subscriptions at how much each? 28 bucks each? So what are we going to do there, guys? We're going to have cash of 6,300 at 28 bucks. Thank you. And what is that going to be? 6,300 times 28 bucks. I'm not going to, I'm helping you enough. You guys have to do the work or I'm not going to keep doing this. Correct. And we've got unearned, earned subscription revenue because we haven't earned it yet of 176.4. Okay. Now, prepare the adjusting entry on December 31st to record subscription revenue in December. So 6,300 of these subscriptions, they began in December. Now, this is a 12-month magazine because it publishes it monthly, right? So what are we going to do? We're going to take that figure and take one twelfth of it, right? What happens if it was a bi-monthly uh, bi magazine? How many are um, mag six? So then we would take this subscription divided by six. So if it tells us it's a monthly magazine, we're going to take that amount and show we earned one twelfth of it. What if it tells us it's a weekly magazine? 52, I mean, do you understand? It's important to know how often it's being published. So the entry to record as of December 31st, one of the um, prints, publications out of 12, we're going to debit our unearned subscription revenue of how much? What's one twelfth of one seventy six for? Fourteen seven hundred. And we've now earned that money, haven't we? We've we've earned the right to collect that as revenues because we've provided the service. We've realized it. So we now can say subscription revenue of 14.7. Okay? Now let's go and look. Prepare the adjusting entry on March 31st to record subscription revenue in the first quarter of 2015. How many magazines um, did we publish in the first quarter? Three. Three. So are we going to take that figure of the 14,700, which is the monthly figure, times three, right? Unearned subscription 
revenue of uh, 441 and we're going to have subscription revenue of 441 right okay now what I'd like to do is let's look at exercise 1010. This is starting to get into the bond piece that we're really going to focus on in this chapter. Canyon Company issued 600,000 10-year 6% bonds at 103. Is that a premium or a discount? Premium. Premium. Suppose, oh, oh, excuse me, we need to prepare the journal entry to record the sale of these bonds on January 1st, 2014. So how are we going to record it? What's the first thing we're going to do? Cash of what? How much did we receive? Did we receive just the 100% of face value? Or did we receive 103% of face value? We received 103%. So 600,000 times 1.03 is 618. Now, how much is that face value on the bonds? Bonds payable, 600,000. What is we have a premium so we're gonna call it premium on bonds payable of 18,000 do you see how we record when bonds are issued at a premium we receive the cash up front of the hundred three percent and we always keep that bonds payable at that face amount, and the difference is going to either be a premium or a discount, okay? The next thing we're going to see here, suppose the remaining premium on bonds payable was 10800 on December 31st, 2017. Show the balance sheet presentation on this date. So basically what they're telling us is we had a premium of 18,000, okay? But we've amortized it down to only 10,800. How are we going to show these premiums on the balance sheet? So what we're going to do here is we're going to take our long-term liabilities we're going to record it as a bonds payable due in 2024 for 600000 And then with the premiums, we're going to add premium on bonds payable of 10800 to show our long-term liability is a 6108 here now the next question says to us explain why the bonds sold at a price above the face amount why would we sell them for 103 percent the bonds sold for more than their face value face amount because the contract interest rate of six percent is higher than the market price interest rate when the contract rate is higher then the market price, market rate, bonds sell at a premium. The opposite is true for discounts. OK. 
How are you guys doing? Well, we know that if we issue them for a premium, then we know that it has to be. If we issue it for a discount, then we know that the face amount is below the market rate. Let's go now and let's go back to our slides. Here, Candlestick Inc. is going to sell $100,000 five year, 10% bonds at 98. Is this a premium or a discount? Discount. So, does that mean that the interest rate on the bonds is greater than or less than the market rate? It's less than. So, we're selling them at a discount so we can um, have a gr um, the market rate compete with the market. So if we sell them at 98% of face value, we're going to receive cash of only 98,000. We're going to have what's called a discount on bonds payable of two, and yet our bonds payable is always going to show up as the face amount. So <coughs> when we're dealing with bonds, discounts, or premiums, know in the balance sheet under the long-term liabilities, we're going to show not only just the bonds payable, but we're going to take into account the premium, like I showed you in that example, or the discount here. So our long-term liabilities is going to be the face amount plus a premium or the face amount minus the discount rate. Sale of bonds below face value causes the total cost of borrowing to be more than the interest bond interest paid. The reason the borrower is required to pay the bond discount at the maturity date. Thus, the bond discounts considered to be an increase in the cost of borrowing. Because they're going to want the market rate, aren't they? So if they want the market rate, we're not going to be able to get the whole face value of the bonds. We're going to have to take that into account when we return the money. Um, Total cost of borrowing. Let's look here. Bonds that are issued at a discount below the face value. If we look at the annual interest payments, 100,000 face value at 10% is going to equal $10,000 or for over five years, 50,000. If we add in this discount of 2,000, we're really the interest or the cost to really borrow this money is really 52,000 not just 50. See how the market rate is higher than the face value because they're going to get back this 52,000. Ultimately, we can't um, they want a greater interest rate than what we're providing, so that's why they um, buy the amount for less. So as you can see here, interest payments of 50,000 Cash ultimately is going to be paid of 150000 to those bondholders. But what did we get from them? Only 98000 So do you see how they're going to get more money? So the discount on bonds payable has a normal credit account balance, is a contra account, is added to bonds payable on the balance sheet, or increases over the term of the bonds. What do you think? It's kind of like the accumulated depreciation we do with assets. Do you know what I'm talking about? You have equipment and then you show accumulated, accumulated depreciation to give you a, your new adjusted balance or book value. The same is true with bonds. This discount on bonds payable or premium on bonds payable is like a contra account to come up with the true value of those bonds. Let's look at the premium pay way. Assume that the Candlestick Inc. bonds previously described sell at 102 rather than at 98. How are we going to record this? We're going to get more cash, 102,000, and the bonds are going to only be 100, so we've got a premium on bonds payable. This means the face value is greater than the market value. In the financial statements, we're going to show 
the bonds payable at the face value. We're going to add the premium to show the new bonds payable is at 102000 The sale of bonds above the face value causes the total cost of borrowing to be less than the bond interest paid. The borrower is not required to pay the bond premium at the maturity date of the bonds. The bond premium is considered to be a reduction in the cost of borrowing the money. So technically, we would think we need to pay interest of 50000 But because it's at a cheaper rate, we're selling it greater, we get to subtract this 2000 from the cost of borrowing the bonds. So we're really only spending 48000 for those bonds, not fifty or fifty two as in the discount. Okay? Does that make sense, guys? Once bonds are redeemed, this is how we're going to show it. The bonds payable that face amount zeroes out. The cash is equivalent to those bonds payable. When the company retires bonds before maturity, we've got to then do an, a little bit of extra work. What's going to happen here is at the end of the fourth period, Candlestick, having sold its bonds at a premium originally, retires the bonds at 103 after paying the annual interest. Assume the carrying value of the bonds at the redemption date is 100400 Candlestick records the redemption at the end of the fourth period as the bonds of 100000 We need to get rid of that premium on bonds. We're showing the cash at 103000 because it tells us it's retiring the bonds at 103. So if we know all these other figures. We'll know then we had a loss on this bond redemption of 2600 um, I want to go through one more problem, and then I think we're going to call it good. Let's look at Let's look at exercise 1012. We might do two more problems. Exercise 1012. Assume the following are independent situations recently reported in the Wall Street Journal. General Electric 7% bonds maturing January 28, 2015 were issued at 111.12. Were the General Electric bonds sold issued at a premium or a discount? Premium. Boeing 7% bonds maturing September 24th, 2029 were issued at 99.08. Was this Boeing bond issued at a premium or a discount? Discount. discount. Explain how bonds both paying the same contractual interest rate could be issued at different prices. The prices of those bonds differ because the bond price is based on the market rate of interest, not what's sitting on those bonds as the stated rate. So in this scenario, you know that the market rates had to have been different. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because they were issued, one was issued at a premium, one was issued at a discount. Prepare the journal entry to record the issue of each of these two bonds, assuming each company issued $800,000 of bonds in total. So we're showing they issued $800,000 of bonds. So how would we record the journal entry to show that these 7% bonds were issued at 111.12? How are we going to do that, guys? What are we going to do? We're going to debit cash 800,000 times what? 111.12% or that equals what? Eight. 
888-960. We know our bonds payable need to be how much? 800,000. So we've got a premium on bonds payable of how much? 88,960, don't we? What if we issue those bonds for 99.08%? What is it going to be? That's going to be how much? 792,640. We know our bonds payable is going to be 800,000. So this shows a discount on bonds payable of how much? 7,360. Does that make sense to you guys? What I would like to do on um, next Tuesday is we're going to pick back up right where we left off here. So if you have been confused with what we're doing here, please look at the lectures, okay? I'll send an email out to everyone saying, hey, this has been a, a really informative day. If you weren't in class, you know, listen to the lectures. And we're going to start, we're going to finish up with some problems. Um, specifically, we're going to look at um, exercise 14 and 15, and then we're going to look at some ratios and move on to then chapter 11. Okay? So you guys have.